I throw the caveat out there again that while I believe in explicit and systematic phonics instruction does help and is I don't think that is the root cause of the fourth grade slump nor the achievement gap. Just the same kind of caveat I give before all these lessons. I think it has more to do with being prepared for academic dose courses when you come to class. However, because you are required to pass the foundations test, and you do need to know this stuff. I mean, you, have, you will be required to teach phonics. I just think it is part of a much larger literature, literacy, language, and culture program in our classrooms. Um, so it is not the end-all, be-all. Just teaching phonics will not have kids be able to comprehend. Uh, you can decode and still not be able to comprehend, which is basically what happens when we've talked about constantly about that fourth grade slump. Um, yet it is extremely important. It is the foundation of, of when we, we read the Appendix A of the Common Course and Standards, we looked at the reading foundations for K3, phonics and the explicit and systematic instruction <coughs> is a major cornerstone, especially in kindergarten, first, second, and a little bit in third grade. So when I say when I say explicit and when I say systematic, what do you think I mean? Explicit and systematic. What do I mean by that? I've been talking about explicit instruction since like day one. So let's start there. Yes, ma'am. Well, I just think of it as like like a clear, detailed way of teaching. Yeah, they're not like explaining something. Yeah, you explain. You you're doing a literal explanation. It's not implicit in the idea that you give them a book to read and expect them to just figure out how to decode. You're teaching them explicit decoding instructions. So that's explicit. What do I mean by systematic? If I want my phonics instruction to be both explicit and systematic, what do you think systematic means? Alec? Can it be like teaching them a certain order? Yeah, order, scope, and sequence. That there's um, blah, 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 blah. That their expectations kindergarten, kindergarten, first grade, first grade, second grade, third grade. That's what I mean by systematic. That you have a plan, you have a system. So, what is phonics? It's not the best representation image wise, but it was too cute to ignore, so I put it in there. What is phonics? Anyone want to take a stab? I heard some when you guys were working on your your um, test for SPED that you had a good definite difference between phonics and phonemic awareness. What was that rule of thumb that you guys were using, and gals? Alan? Uh, I think both. I mean, yeah, you hear and see. And phonemic awareness, you just see. So phonics is really the relationship between phonology and orthography. All right, that's that's really what we're talking about: the sounds of speech and the spelling patterns, orthography. So how do those sounds work with our spelling? Phonolo phonology and orthography. That's phonics. <coughs> What affects letter sounds? Take a guess. What affects what <laughs> sounds the letters make? What? Smell. Well, yeah, not, I mean, like in orthography, in, in wow. its spelling. Not, and we did, we did talk about where different sounds in, in your mouth come from. We read that whole chapter. Like the placement of letters. The placement of letters, that's one. That's a great one. Yep. Yeah. Tracy? If there's certain letters that fall under or if you put it. Yeah. Certain letters, so placement. Certain grammar rules. Grammar rules, and where do grammar rules come from? Think about the English language. It's okay if you don't know this. I'm just trying, we're just playing games. Tanya? Would it be like the alphabetical principle? Is that what happens there? A little bit. It does draw, but you're, you're getting closer that certain letters think, can make different sounds. 
Think about C H. It could be church. It could be chauffeur. What's chauffeur sound like? What? Yeah, but it's like what where do you think the word chauffeur comes from? What? Yeah, it's not English. Where what what's it say? Hmm? The origin of the word, yes. Letter sounds are affected by two things. It's placement in the word and it's surrounding letters, like you had also mentioned. And also the origin of the word. word. So if we take CH sound, right? Chain, English. Chauffeur, French. Chaos, Greek. Three different sounds, same letter. Because of its origin. English is a mismatch of different languages. That's why it is so painfully complicated. What do I mean? Well, we know this, right? There's 44 phonemes and 26 letters. So is it a one-to-one -one or two-to-one -one correspondence to represent those 44 phonemes in, in written language? Do you think it's two to one? What do we think? How many how many ways are there to write those 44 phonemes? Hundreds? Thousands? Keep guessing. Take guesses. You can't get in trouble for guessing. How many ways do we write 44 phonemes? Five thousand. There's one guess. I've heard a few hundred. I've heard five thousand. I've heard one hundred. <coughs> Anybody else have any more guesses? Thirty thousand. Thirty thousand. It's five hundred. There's about five hundred ways. <laughs> so Tanya wins the award. If I had a big thing of like jelly beans, she would have gotten the closest with her few hundred. This is Price is Right. Anybody that said a thousand? No, you're over. You can't be over. It should have been a dollar. So when we talk about phonics, we're talking really about two things. Consonants and vowels. Now, consonants usually represent one sound. Now, what is a blend? <laughs> Peter? Two consonants that they work together to make one sound? Yes. Two or three consonants that work together to make one sound, like a belt. Bell and T. Grass. G and R. I don't, know, I don't think they count the two S's as two consonants making one sound. What about a digraph? It's a digraph then. It's Peter again. Um, I'm going to say it's two consonants that make a different sound than what is there. Yes, it's two consonants that make up a whole new sound. The most frequent one is like S and H and C and H. There is no sh letter. There is no ch letter. That is a digraph. And you do need to know these terms. So, I found this kind of neat little way to remember. You know this, Rebecca, or something? It's annoying. 
<laughs> Why? You have to know it for another class? We did this with our whole exam. Clover? Yeah, Clover. Okay. We never learned it like that, so that would have been a lot easier. Yes. <laughs> what? Oh, knowing this? Well, there's closed consonants, and then so if we know this, let's, Rebecca, what is it? Closed consonants have, or syllables have. Vowel, consonant, vowel. Yeah, CDC. The other one is the consonant LE. The open sound, notice open starts with O. Vowel combinations. Obviously our, our favorite silent E rule. And then the rule that makes absolutely no sense, the R control, because there's about as many different R controlled sounds as there are letters. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But I use this kind of idea of clover to remember this. And um, you don't have to write the whole. What's that called? A memory device where you turn into a word? What's that word called? Yes. You do not need to write the entire mnemonic of the device down. If you want it, you are free to go to YouTube. Um, or if I will make sure I put the presentations back up on Blackboard. I think I owe you a couple. But you can always just go to my YouTube channel because they're always all right there. That. The vowels represent many sounds. And I talked about this, how in my son's kindergarten classroom they have Letterland and are visited by Mr. Letters and Mrs. Vowels. And I talked about I wonder, I didn't really understand the, uh, the correlation there. Like, and I wondered if we're genderifying reading instruction there, or I'm thinking too much about it. Um, or maybe vowels are just as complicated to figure out as women. Um, and so that's, I don't know. It just seems like we're, there's some kind of genderedness there, but I just haven't been able to get my hands on it. So we have specific vowel combinations. Obviously, one vowel usually represents one or the what are the two most common vowel sounds? Long. What? Long and short, big little, however you want to call them. I mean, long and short is like the technical term, but we usually call them like big little um, at the school level. Because we see the little e makes a big sound. It's our friend, it helps us out. Um, but there's also vowel combinations. You have your digraph, which is your two vowels, one sound. Can anybody give me an example of a digraph? Yeah. What? In a word? Nail. Nail, yeah. Team. Team, E-A and team. A-I and nail. Loud, coat. Loud, yeah, coat. What about diphthongs? Now, diphthongs are different. They misspell the word glide. See, I really I wanted to emphasize vowels by leaving one out to show you how ridiculous words would be about vowels. And maybe that's why they're misses, because no family can be held together without them. Thus making up for my wildly sexist commenter. Um, they glide from one sound to another. Anybody give me an example? Yes, ma'am. O Y. And what word? Boy. 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 <coughs> the oi sounds are very common diphthongs. What are the diphthongs are there besides your own oh, I, oh. Yeah, bo uh, boil or in yeah, um, house. You know, house is a new sound, through is not. Um, so those are kind of your, your, your list of diphthongs. And then, of course, going back to our friendly R controlled vowels that we talked about. And there are bird. Um, which, you know, there are so many different kinds of R-controlled um, sounds out there. So that's the basics of phonics. And it is the basics of instruction in a lot of reading classrooms in the kindergarten. Um, I mean, you'll still have story time. And again, though, what have I reiterated over and over again? The best way to build... Literacy skills, in my mind, is text-based talking, text-based analysis. And at the early child level, 
You want to be building in opportunities for authentic talk. Now, our blending of sounds. This involves our phonograms. And again, another spelling error. This is what happens when you do a lecture 10 minutes before class starts. And then you upload it to YouTube with wildly inappropriate spelling mistakes. Um, phonograms, one syllable words, and al alibis, syllables. So, you know, a phonogram could also be like a syllable within a word. And they're broken up in onset and rhymes. Fancy pants way of saying beginning and end. Starting sound, end sound. A lot of teachers call rhymes word families in schools. You'll see. What? What'd you say? I got that wrong. <laughs> I, I mean, I could, maybe they're wrong too, but I mean, I, you see that often. Yeah. Not everything teachers do is always correct. And there's 37 common rhymes. And you can do activities around these rhymes, like act, back, jack, smack, attack. Rhyming poems, there's lots of activities. And you'll see teachers, especially starting in like second and third grade, most spelling games are based off of onset. I mean, most spelling lessons and spelling groups are based off of onsets and rhymes at the first, second, third grade spelling levels. And so these are kind of your 37 most Frequent rhymes. Very, if you play almost any phonics game on an iPad or a tablet or a computer, they're going to be based off of your rhymes. When we talk about substitutions, substituting onsets and rhymes, this is what they're doing. They'll take jug and switch with mug. Again, though, if it's a phonemic awareness, I'll have a picture of a jug and a picture of a mug and switch them out. If it's phonics, you'd be switching out the letters. Because now we're talking about orthography, spelling patterns, phonology, and sounds together. So what are some important terminology that you must know? Everything I just went over. Your syllable types, your closed, open, R controlled, silent E, digraph, diphthongs, um, your consonant LEs, your blends. I'll put this up there. Memorize this. Know it. Live it. No, you don't have to write it down now because I, I'm going to give it to you. It's also, you already have this. This is just a screenshot right out of your book. I don't know the exact page number. I should have cited it on the slide. Um, but that's literally just, it's lifted right from chapter, the building blocks of literacy, chapter two in the elementary literacy book. So how do you teach this stuff, though? That's all the background and the science behind it. That means nothing. What I'm really interested in is... is how do you teach it? Well, first, teach the most common phonics rules. And I think in your book, on page 163, no, that's our sequence. Yeah, on page 161, you'll see a list of the most useful phonics, phonic rules on page 151. Build those into your lessons. But most important, here comes the systematic. If you have your book, please open it to page 163. That looks like a lovely, doesn't it? <coughs> so 
there like a focus <laughs> button on this thing? Turn the light off behind you. Let me see if that fixes the dot cam. No, it just looks bad no matter what I do. What? There we go. So it basically goes through, you know, you're starting off in kindergarten and you're doing your more common consonants. You're really just matching sound to letters. B, B. And I told you again, like my son and his Mr. C story. Mr. C fits in the letter land. He was so, he was cu cu crying because he didn't have a sound. And Mr. K was cu cu kind. So he lent him his. And Mr. S knew that Mr. C was s s sad, so he lent him a sound too. So Mr. C can say the ca ca sound in a s s sound, but he usually just uses the ca ca sound. So what they're doing there is they're telling these little stories, but they're basically focusing in on common consonants. Then, you know, you start working on your CVC words, kindergarten, first grade, maybe some short vowel sounds. Um, and you start working off in the first grade where you start to talk about phonograms in a word, you know, not dot, shot. They're starting to do those kinds of spelling words. Or right, you're starting to give them cover words and um, digraphs using the th and the ch. So use this page. It's a good example of what systematic instruction would look like. You know, so by the end of second and third grade, you're working on your R controlled vowels, your less common consonant digraphs, your vowel digraphs, or your vowel diphthongs, sorry, your less common vowel digraphs. You can, I mean, it's, it's a plan. You're starting with just B makes the buzz sound, going all the way to your tough words like walk and caught. <coughs> That's where you require your explicit instruction. This doesn't mean you're done with phonemic awareness. Use your oral activities, use those opportunities to reinforce phonemic awareness simultaneously that you're introducing phonics. And then later in the grades, you start using spelling to teach phonics. And I see this all the time when I grade my literacy centers in 307. Oh, I'm just going to give them a spelling assignment and they have to write down the words five times and look them up in the dictionary. That's not teaching the spelling, the common phonics patterns. You need to do spell. You need to do spelling, and I have to rework the syllabus so it, that we get a, a week of spelling built in. But you need to be doing teaching, kind of having students recognize orthography, word study, origins of words. You start off spelling by by in phonics, you know, onsets and rhymes, and then you get to things like word origins. You get to things like morphology. Like every time, what happens when you add a um, O-U-S onto a word? Fiction becomes fictitious. That became an adjective. What's it, you know, what's it do to spelling? So spelling falls a developmental approach, and we will talk about that later in the semester. Now, you teach explicitly through mini lessons. No different with phonics. And you are all going to team teach a phonics lesson on October 30th through a mini lesson. What are some of the ideas that you could do? Word sorts. So where's an O sound, an O sound, an O sound, and the oddball sounds? I actually, when I do word sorts, I don't give kids, I don't tell them at first how I want them sorted. I just cut up the words. Give them out and say, now I want you folks to decide how they should go in, in patterns. If you were in, most of you had me in 307 last year, we actually did this when we practiced our literacy center. Um, 
I didn't get the chance to do it this year. But, and then I have them try to guess what the rules are. Then I would give them the sheet and have them sort out the words. So word sorts is an effective mini lesson for teaching phonics. The magnetic boards, white, I mean not magnetic boards, I'm getting ahead of myself. The white boards, you see these all the time in the classroom where each kid might have an individual white board. They're usually not that big, they're often just a little slate that they keep right in front of them, that they use. Um, they're a very effective way to do mini lessons. Um, you won't have those options for a whiteboard for your mini lessons on the 30th, so you can ask me ahead of time and maybe get some chart paper for me and you can cut it up. Or you just bring in pieces of paper for, for kids to use. Magnetic letters, always a fun. Now, this is your explicit teaching these mini lessons. These work very well for independent centers too. During your center time. However, you do, like with all the good centers, they're connected to your teaching, so you would have already done a mini lesson on these activities. So look, now we're focusing on the vowels are, you know, O and A are connected, the O, O are connected, so they're teaching the kids the sounds. And two vowels does that make one sound is called a two vowels make one sound. What? Yeah, I'm with two vowels. Food. And what's a diphthong? Yes. You could use like um, word walls. Word walls are so common with phonograms. And what are the two key words that go along with a phonogram? Onset and rhyme. So I could put up snake, jake, bake, flake, make, and group them by group them by group the phonograms by their rhymes. It's a very common teaching strategy. So there's lots of fun ways to build in mini lessons for phonics. That's your explicit instruction. You also use your just-in-time instruction when you see kids maybe struggling with a word during reading. Or if you're reading a big book, like they were just, I went to my son's school yesterday for um, special friend day. And they were obviously doing Christopher Columbus. Um, and they were reading a big book. There was an opportunity in there for the teacher to stop and, and work on a word. That's kind of your implicit instruction. You just kind of do it just in time. Or if you see a kid struggling when they say a word or when they read a word. So it's not just explicit instruction. And it's not totally devoid of the literature and literacy and the information in your talk that you use in your classroom. We also need to talk a little bit about sight words. We basically do this with like your hundred most common words. Um, they're often not easily decodable. You just need to know them. Teachers do things like use word walls, and you introduce a few at a time in kindergarten. I think a common mistake teachers make are introducing too many sight words at once. Repeated exposure to sight words in multiple scenarios in simulations is the best way for kids to learn them. Basically, your memory isn't like videotape. It isn't like a file. We have these, when we go back to how our theoretical underpinnings of reading, some view them from the cognitive perspective that we have a computer file. We just, oh, you know, on is O-N. Is is I-S, can is C-A-N. I have to go in my sight words folder, pull out, and this is there in memory. Others view memory as kind of like videotape, that we just record everything. But it's not. Memory is like so connected to our situation and the place we're in that it changes. So the best way to have kids remember sight words is through multiple exposures, multiple cases, using multiple modes. 
right? Let them sing songs of sight words. Let them touch sight words. Let them, I'm not saying I believe in learning styles. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, oh, I'm a, you know, a kinetic learner, so I need to dance my sight words. You know, I all think that's all nonsense. Um, what I believe in is that when you see things in multiple modes, over with through repeated exposures, you're allowing the brain to create new kinds of simulations that they could connect to in different environments. And that's what helps kids remember sight words. Spelling is our next method, and that will be coming up later in on the semester. Okay. Any questions on phonics? On Monday, we will be talking about assessing phonics. We will look at a different few different um, diagnostic assessments that are used um, that use both common words and nonsense words. And you will give an assessment to each other, which you'll all define on. Um, it's not the point, but it's just a practice. So we'll do that on Monday. Any other questions before we go into review for our phonemic awareness, phonics, and